Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Healthy Eating, the Psychology of Consumer Decision Making webinar. My name is Joanne Murphy, and I am delighted to host this session on behalf of NUI Galway. We have had a super response to the webinar with over 250 people registered to attend, which is simply fantastic. This webinar is uh, part of a series hosted by the European funded project AFES, a quadruple helix Atlantic area healthy food ecosystem for growth of SMEs. This project is run by an international consortium with Atlantic area partners from Ireland, Spain, Wales, France and Portugal, seeking to improve the competitiveness and growth of SMEs in the value chain of healthy eating and daily life. Specifically, AFIS's mission is to achieve an ecosystem of healthy food in the Atlantic area of four propellers, public authorities, industry, research and citizens for the growth of SMEs in food industry. Training and supports are designed to promote the competitiveness and growth of SMEs, providing them with advanced and personalized support services that allow them to innovate in healthy foods and lifestyles. Today's webinar promises to be both insightful and informative, with our speakers providing unique insights and a deeper understanding of psychological influences on consumer food purchases, which can inform and impact product design, development, advertising, and ultimately sales and profitability. To get us started, Dr. Jane Walsh will open the session. Dr. Walsh is a director of the M Health Research Group here in NUI Galway and leader of Health and Wellbeing Cluster in the Whitaker Institute. She is a work package leader on the AFES project and together with her team, led the work on market and consumer analysis for innovators and innovations in the food industry. This event is the second in a series of webinars hosted to support SMEs operating within the food sector. Jane, uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and uh, for hosting and organizing today's webinar. Joanne, thank you very much and um, very welcome to everyone who's signed up and is here today and a huge thanks in advance to our speakers. Delighted to be hosting this webinar as part of the AFES project. Looking forward to an excellent discussion. We have a great mix of people signed up from SMEs in the food industry to interested researchers, members of the public. And this particular webinar is going to give some really valuable insights on what are the things that influence our food choices and eating from marketing, from psychology, that mystery, and of course, from the food industry. So with that, I'm going to hand you back to Joanne, who's going to introduce our first speaker, and hope you enjoy. Thank you, Jane. Now, before we welcome our guest speakers, some housekeeping for you joining us today. This webinar is being recorded and will be available afterwards. We will be holding a question and answer session after our three panelists have made their presentations, but please use the Q&A function to ask questions uh, throughout the session, and we will do our best to facilitate all of those that come in in the last 15 or 20 minutes or so of the webinar. Now, as we introduce our first speaker, please do tell us in the chat where you are tuning in from. We have had a great uh, interest across the board, across Europe and indeed over in the US uh, for today's webinar. So please do tell us where you are tuning in from this afternoon. Now to our first speaker, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Elaine Wallace, Associate Professor in Marketing and Associate Director of the Whitaker Institute of Innovation and Societal Change at NUI Galway. Her research interests and expertise lie in the areas of brands and social media, social networks, social media and business outcomes, gamification and behavior outcomes, consumer and employee behavior and performance management. Elaine's research has appeared in leading international peer reviewed journals, and she is co-author of Creating Powerful Brands, the fourth edition. Previously, Elaine held various marketing roles in Boots Healthcare, GlaxoSmithKline, which is formerly SmithKline Beecham, Unilever and Siemens Limited. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Joanne, and thank you for that lovely introduction as well. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this this afternoon and looking forward to, to sharing my presentation with you. Um, I'll just open the slides here and, and maybe kick off if that suits. Perfect. That's um, great. Just make sure that they're they're visible there. They are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll turn off my video and mute myself now as well. The floor is all yours, Elaine. Thanks so much. That's super. Thanks very much. 
Um, so hello everybody and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this session this afternoon. As Joanne said, my name is Elaine Wallace and I'm in marketing and so I'm coming at this presentation from the perspective of looking at the marketing implications, particularly of social media and insights from social media and gamification and just pulling up insights from three studies that we've done so far um, and the questions that we answer with those which might be relevant for you. So the first of those is really what motivates people to post on social media, but perhaps most importantly, and, and considering there's SMEs on this call as well, and you're interested in using perhaps social media, does what people post on social media reflect what they do offline? And how would that relate to brand outcomes, for instance? And how would new technologies such as advert games um, influence what we think or do? So I have an example of a study that we did actually with a food brand. And then how does all of that help us if we're marketing food products or motivating healthy eating? And so the first of the studies that I'm just going to look at is the outcomes of social media use and how are the outcomes of that. Now, I would say that, that if anybody's interested in actually looking at the specific studies, I can provide them to you and I'll have my email address as well at the end of the presentation. So delighted to answer questions in the Q&A too. So the first one is on Instagram. And I think we all are familiar with Instagram. It has more than a billion monthly active users. And in Ireland, it has 1.2 million Instagram users so you know people are very active on this site one of the reasons is a visual medium and so people like to share images photographs and so on um, in terms of the profile it's mainly women so the women are 25 to 34 years of age um, majority but also um, it's motivated in part by self-expression needs and so what we mean by that is people are posting in part to say something about themselves and show something about themselves but then that can be a source of social comparison. So we start to look at, well, how am I doing on Instagram relative to somebody else? And one of the initiatives that Instagram took was actually to um, test the initiative of hiding or likes from others. So hiding what, um, how many likes, for instance, I would get for a post from other people. So my followers cannot see how many likes that I get. And they thought that this would depressurize Instagram. So if you think of Instagram as uh, likes as a game that people would play. So in other words, people want to get a large number of likes. We looked at whether or not the made a difference whether those likes were hidden from other people or not and that would tell us a little bit more about people's use of instagram and their emotions in using instagram so we conducted experiments with instagram users in the us and we investigated first of all asked people well how many likes would you expect for a post so we asked them to think about making a fairly general post so not posting a selfie because that's far too personal but a general post a general image how many likes would they expect to get and then we we put them in in what we call a, a two by two design where we randomized um the allocation of people so they either got a lot more likes than they expected are far fewer likes than they expected and then on the other side of that either their followers could see how many likes they could get or they couldn't see that so we wanted to see you know if you imagine if you got loads of likes but your followers could see it is that different to getting loads of likes but that's actually hidden from your followers and likewise if you got very few likes so we then afterwards measured loneliness and negative affect so feelings of being upset and anxious and actually what we found was that people who got a lot less likes so far fewer likes than they hoped for were more lonely as a consequence. So we figured that people were actually reaching out with these Instagram to connect with other people. But people whose high number of likes were visible to others experienced this kind of negative emotion. So what was going on that they were a bit more self-conscious. They realized other people were checking in in terms of um, looking at how many likes you were getting. And if those likes were going up, it was making you actually a little bit more um, upset and anxious while at the same time helping you feel less lonely. It's a bit of a contradiction. So we felt that people were getting caught in this vicious cycle of looking for likes. Now, from the point of view of marketing, 
what does that really tell us? Well, first of all, we see that Instagram's users are seeking to get likes for posts. And one of the reasons that people do this is because sometimes people are lonely and they're trying to reach out and connect. And a like is a way of getting social acceptance. Um, users might prefer, therefore, to post images that help to show their popularity. And so if people are, are seeding images on Instagram, something that allows people to show popularity to others will be more shared and will be more connected with other people. And also this notion that people People are in competition with likes that does seem to be the case or in competition for likes rather so images that people believe will get more likes will be shared so something that allows them to show off in some way will be more likely to be shared so useful insights i think in terms of how we might consider posts by brands for instance on social media but we we looked at this also in terms of facebook um, Facebook is a slightly different network in that it's reciprocal. So if I connect to you, you automatically connect to me. And we wanted to see if people's posts reflect their behavior. So the, we know that there are 3.6 million Facebook users in Ireland, again, slightly skewed towards female and 24%, 25 to 34 years of age. So it's still relatively young. Um, we know that brands are used to construct a kind of an identity on Facebook sometimes it might not be a true self it might be what we call a social self so how we want to actually express ourselves so you know we can we can say anything on Facebook and it might not be accurate it could be um, a sort of a, an exaggeration of ourselves for instance and we wondered well if you like something does that lead to outcomes? For instance, if you like a brand, will you buy that brand? Will you offer word of mouth for that brand? So we conducted a survey um, in, in Ireland among students and those students were accessed via Students' Union email, and we were asking them to think about brands in particular that they liked on Facebook. So if they liked more than one brand, we told them to consider the brand that came to mind most of those brands that they liked. So what do they like? Well, first of all, they like fashion. Uh, probably not surprising. It's very self-expressive, but also sport and also soft drinks, alcohol, retail and fast food and you can see also in their food brands i should say some people were liking because they were receiving incentive to like as well so sometimes people liked and they got for instance a discount for liking so just to, to mention that so what we found and this was our model without going too much into the the background to this when the brand allowed somebody to express a true self or they believed that they would offer word of mouth for that brand offline um, they would not accept wrongdoing by the brand. So they had a very sort of an authentic and strong relationship with that brand. On the other hand, when the brand just allowed them to show off and express themselves in a sort of a, a more insincere way, but it's sort of social self-expression, if you like, they wouldn't talk of that brand. They wouldn't talk about it with other people. Um, and they would accept wrongdoing by the brand. And therefore, they were sort of a little bit insincere, if you like, in their brand relationships. But we did find regardless, if the brand allowed the person to express themselves in some way, reflect their identity in some way, they did love the brand. They had this passionate attachment to it. And as long as that passionate attachment was there, then there were positive brand outcomes. So again, what does that tell us in terms of marketing applications for Facebook? Well, we know that consumers like, they post and they like in order to express either a true self or a social self. So the genuine self or something that's a little bit maybe exaggerated. And those likes are a form of conspicuous consumption. So we want to express something about our tastes and our choice to other people. And we do that through what we post. And so if a company wants to encourage likes, a type of message that could be compelling is to include something about expressing yourself or saying something about yourself and how that sort of reflects your identity and that this brand is very you and how you express that on, on Facebook. Um, and also providing incentives to encourage those to like, to share the brand message with a friend is also important, trying to encourage that sharing on Facebook. And lastly, to enhance word of mouth, the inner self is more important. So 
um, what we're suggesting in the study findings is that if brands share authentic messages about themselves, for instance, maybe the story of the brand, that appeals to the inner self, and therefore people might be more likely to share that and offer word of mouth. So just one final study. Um, this was looking at gamification for a particular food brand. And the food brand here was Oreo cookies. And uh, Oreo actually developed an advert game and, and it was designed for use on mobile phones. So the lead author on this particular study was Sarah Catalan at the University of Zaragoza in Spain. And I was a co-author with Sarah. Um, gamification, just to explain to you, this is where we harness the motivational power of games and we apply design elements from games to sort of non-game context so like a mobile phone app for instance and then advert games are a type of game that contains advertising messages so it's not like the pop-ups that you might get if you were on a game it's actually that the advertising is part of the structure of the game so slightly different the brand is the focus of the game and they adopt the same type of format as these kind of casual games like candy crush or, or angry birds and these types of games, they have a simple design and they're designed to be played during breaks in the day. So people pick them up, leave them down, but they, they're designed to move you on, for instance, to the next level. So we were looking at the flow that people had in playing the game and how engaged they were in playing the game. And then other measures such as brand attitude, purchase intention and brand familiarity. And the example here, as I said, was Oreo. So the, the brand has this mechanism called twist, lick, lick, dunk. So if you think of an Oreo cookie, it's got two sides. There's a piece of kind of cream in the middle. You can twist it. The idea was that they were encouraging people to twist the cookie, have a lick the cream, and then dunk the biscuit. And this is what they wanted people to learn in the game. So we actually used that advert game from that real setting. And the data collection we had, again, was among students of university. And there were two phases to the study. So first of all, the participants downloaded the game, and that was free, so they could play it as often as they liked, but at least once. And then they filled out a questionnaire for us. So these are a couple of stills from the games. You can see the twist piece. So they're sort of splitting the biscuit in two. And this is based on a game called Fruit Ninja. So you can slide across like this. And then you dunk. See, so the challenge is to get the dunk into the drink. So again, as you went through sort of this level and you got more points, you went on to the next level. So the students were playing this game. So what we found from this study, actually, was that that flow experience of being totally absorbed in playing the game. So to the point where you might forget what's going on around you, you're hooked into this playing this game. It actually positively influenced purchase intention in this study. And repetition also had a positive effect on brand attitude and purchase intention. And the more the customer played, the more positive they felt about the brand. So actually that sort of repetition, familiarity, really improved attitude towards the brand. And familiarity also increased purchase intention. So the advert games were very effective, but also they were more effective for brands that people were already familiar with. So some people were already familiar with Oreo, and that also helped the outcomes in terms of, for instance, purchase intention. So for advert games, um, you know, some tips, I suppose, from our study, creating games that people want to play, often particularly with several levels of complexity, creating games in ways that challenge players to make it easy to play, but difficult to master. So, you know, it's not that you want to play the whole thing all in one day, but there has to be some sort of challenge in there as well. Try to design a game that has a bit of flow in the game. And if the brand is not familiar, create the awareness first and then invite people to play the game. So overall, in terms of making the most of social media, advice that we would have for marketers and for SMEs who are marketing food brands as well. First of all, think about ways to encourage sharing. So think about ways of, of excuse me, apologies, find ways to encourage sharing on social media. So sharing of images and sharing of posts. And even those who share purely for self-promotion reasons, um, they actually do have, they tend to have large social networks. So even if they're just expressing a social self, they're nevertheless valuable because they're offering valuable exposure for the brand. On the other side, 
We may want to appeal also to the authentic self image because we want some positive outcomes, perhaps such as word of mouth, people to engage offline as well. And here your brand stories matter. So having um, an authentic message about your brand is very valuable in, in those instances. So I hope those, those brand stories and those, those studies are helpful. If people want to contact me afterwards for any of those pieces of research, they're very welcome. And otherwise, I'll hand back to you, Joanne. Apologies, I've suddenly started to lose my voice here. Um, and I look forward to the rest of the presentations. Thanks very much. Lovely. Thank you so much, um, Elaine. That was very insightful. Uh, don't forget, uh, those of you who have uh, joined us maybe late, that you can use the Q&A function to ask any questions, which we will have our panel Q&A once our final speaker has uh, given their presentation. So thanks again, Elaine, that was absolutely brilliant. So uh, next up, it is Dr. Dennis O'Hora, who is an experimental psychologist in the School of Psychology at the National University of Ireland here in Galway. Originally a research scientist working on learning and decision-making, he has spent the last 10 years working on supporting enhanced decision-making in real world settings. He is particularly interested in facilitating behaviors that underpin a sustainable future and has investigated decisions with respect to water quality, climate change, adaptation, and household electricity usage. All very topical at the moment, uh, uh, Dennis. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I believe you have a presentation you'd like to share with our audience today as well. Thank you very much, Joanne. And thank you to all of you who've, who are tuning in from all over Europe and, and even I, I can see New York and in Indonesia represented there. So thank you all very much for taking time out of your day, whether it's late in the evening, early in the morning or, uh, or whatever time it is for you. Um, I'm going to speak to you today a little bit about consumer psychology and purchasing healthy products uh, because I thought this might be the most uh, useful way to introduce some relatively straightforward, relatively um, straightforward ideas uh, from consumer psychology that you might be able to use and, and take advantage of in, in thinking about how best to, to, um, to, to promote your products. So um, what we're going to talk about today is why would anyone buy your product? No. Oh yeah, I'm not trying to be mean. Uh, really, this question is around motivation. And specifically, we're going to talk about two broad kinds of motivation that your, your consumers, your customers might have. And in psychological terms, we talk about these as regulatory focus. That is, what are they trying to do? What, in what frame of mind are they when they're thinking about your brand? And then we're going to talk about a second uh, component to this, which is how do we fit the how to the why? And that is regulatory fit. So how do we fit how they contact your product with the motivations that they already have? Because the better that fit is, the better, the more everything will hang together for that person. Now, individuals have their own default, uh, preferred uh, regulatory focus. But for many of you, you're going to be thinking really, rather than individuals, you're going to be thinking of the individual when they are most likely to contact your product. So you're thinking of an individual in a, in a context. Okay, so uh, the two broad types of regulatory focus that we talk about are, you can be operating with a promotion focus. You're thinking about what you would want, what you, what you would like to experience. And that is a gain focus. So you're thinking about how can I improve and how can I, I'm frustrated if I can't improve. I want to have new experiences. I want to grow. I want, I want to move from where I am right now. Or you might have a prevention focus. A prevention focus, we kind of think, we sometimes use the term needs for these. And this is where you have a loss focus. You're concerned about losing what you have. You want to protect it, maintain it, and you and, and that would be is, is your, your focus. So in this image here on the right hand side of these of these mountaineers on, on this on this mountain, if you're thinking about looking at this image and you're thinking, wow, I'd love to see what they can see. I'd love to feel what they can feel, to, to feel the cold wind on the top of that mountain and to see things that very few people have ever seen. Well, then you're thinking with a promotion, a promotion focus. If, however, you're thinking, oh, I, I hope they don't slip, or 
while it looks like they've got plenty of safety equipment if they if they do slip i, I can see those those are pretty good uh footwear uh and so on that, that looks like a really nice warm jacket i think they're prevent they're protected from the cold then you're thinking in a prevention focus okay and so when it comes to healthy healthy products healthy foods we're, we're going to be thinking around does your consumer purchase healthy foods to feel good which would be a promotion focus or are they doing it to stay healthy and so you might think to yourself well both of these are possible but you're going to find that some segments or some some people are going to be buying to feel good and some are going to be buying to stay healthy when it comes to uh, thinking about prevent promotion and prevention focus I, I, I use an example from my own my own life, which is how I buy tomatoes versus how my wife buys tomatoes, because my I, I'm an Irish person from Cork in the south of Ireland. Uh, apologies, by the way, if I'm speaking too quickly, just let me know uh, if my accent is difficult to understand. But my wife is Italian American. And so I was at, at dinner one time in, in, in America with, with my with my American family. And they started to talk about where to buy the best canned tomatoes and they would arrange to get to stores and pay more for better tomatoes and this was totally uh, uh, this was totally new to me for me tomatoes are tomatoes why would i buy why would i pay anything more for a tomato the, that the, the tomato is a tomato and to my to my wife she's like why would you pay anything for the tomatoes you buy they're they're not even tomatoes you know the the things that, the things that you purchase don't even qualify as tomatoes so when it comes to tomatoes and i think this is a, a common distinction between our southern european and 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 uh, irish maybe northern european people in terms of particularly tomatoes is that you can look at my my focus when it comes to tomatoes which is i needed a certain number of tomatoes for a recipe to complete my shopping so there's a need that needs to be satisfied it will be satisfied by any number by the required number of tomatoes for my for my wife it's about the, there is there is always a better tomato out there and we need to be looking for those better experiences when it comes to tomatoes so when we think about prevention focus and promotion focus if our goal is to maintain or protect the status quo then we're prevention focused if we our goal is to improve upon the status quo we're promotion focused if achieving our goal will feel satisfying complete then that's prevention focused if it's exciting fun yes if we get what we want it'll be great then that's promotion focused if missing your goal will feel worrying unsettling uh, then that's prevention focus. If you're if missing your goal feels boring, useless, then that kind of lack of a buzz, then that is promotion focus. If options are aversive, look, I just need the, I just need to to satisfy what I need to get done here. Then I just need one. I don't need options. I just need what I need. Uh, or I might have a promotion focus in which options are attractive. I like to to sample to browse. Um, if my information seeking motive is vigilance, I want to make sure that I have got exactly what it is I was supposed to get, then it's vigilance, then that's prevention focus. If it's interest, oh, that's, that's a little bit different from this. Ah, that might be, is this better? Is that better? That's interesting to me. That is an information seeking motive of interest. And that's for promotion focus. When it comes to price sensitivity, we can see that typically prevention focus is more price sensitive than promotion focus but there is something we need to think about here which is uh i, I take the example of a plumber okay so when most of us are are hiring a plumber so someone to fix a a, a water problem in your house well your house this is a prevention focus situation you just want a plumber who will definitely get the job done you're not particularly interested in whether they're the best plumber in in the local area you want them now and you want them to get the job done now, given that, you will pay whatever is necessary to get that job done. So in a sense, there is, so price sensitivity is always within context. When we're talking about price sensitivity, really what we're saying is that if there are a set of options out there, then your prevention focused person will be more price sensitive than a promotion focused person. 
So we've talked about prevention focus and promotion focus. And now the next question, the next uh, idea I'm going to bring to you is this idea of regulatory fit. That is, how do we fit the how with the why? So once we have some idea of the why, that is, are our custom customers, our consumers, driven primarily to protect the status quo, or are they driven primarily to, for, by experiencing new things? Then we want to align the, how they contact our product, how and how they how they uh, hear about our product, with that motivation. So regulatory fit is memorable and positive. It just, it's just right, it clicks, right? That just feels right. Um, clashes between the means of, of obtaining something and your motivation are jarring or unsettling. Um, and we, we can think about how can we improve the fit? So if you want to get an example of poor regulatory fit, you might say, what if you went to your doctor's office uh, for an appointment and it looked like, uh, you know, a, a, a cozy coffee shop with many uh, with throws on the on on the, uh, on the on the on the seats and many you know many interesting people walking around doing interesting things, large plants and and so on. You think, hang on, no doctor's office needs to be scientific because we're in a prevention focus. So we want to so clashes between means and motivation can be jarring and unsettling. So how can we fit our, fit with our how to our why? Well, we can fit our brand messaging. So prevention focus, we typically are comforting, serious loss framing. So we might say, our product has been known, uh, or has been shown to reduce the risk of cardiac events. Typically, you want to be wordy, take your time, and, and try, try to impress upon people that you're serious, that this is something that's scientifically based. You're, you're going to try and rule out any of those worries they have. Again, they're going to be coming from a vigilant perspective. They're worried about what, you know, is this really the real deal? Will this definitely sort this out for me? And so you're going to be, uh, the message delivery is going to be vigilant. The brand messaging is going to be comforting, serious, loss framing. We're talking about you could lose out if you don't do this. However, if we're promotion focused, it could be exciting, fun, gain framing. What can we get here? Our product makes you feel great. Experience the new you, right? If you can bring, if your product makes people feel better, feel great, it's a feeling they haven't experienced before, then you can generate that promotion focus. And you can see it in, in how I present myself when I present comforting, serious, versus eager. Uh, so the eager, eager uh, presentation is uh, aligns with promotion focus. Now, you will also, when you're thinking about this, you'll be thinking about your own product. So if your product is typically, you would typically use it to defend against threats, maintain security and avoid losses, then you're typically going to be in the prevention focused, uh, 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 focused area. If it's instead about experience and opportunities to grow, then you're going to be in promotion focus. Uh, fitting with the retail environment, as I said before, scientific ordered places like pharmacies are where we expect it, where we go when we want to uh, prevent loss. We want, we want to protect health, prevention focus. Uh, artistic, chaotic, sensual places are places we go to find new experiences, to be surprised, to be intrigued. All of those, all of those interesting, uncertain but pleasant places. Those are promotion-focused locations, and then we fit with the process of reaching a decision. So when people are making a decision around that's prevention-focused, they satisfy. Now, what does that mean? It means there's a threshold I need to satisfy, and once I'm above that, that's enough. So good enough is good enough. Um, Every, uh, uh, when it comes to it's like when you're playing sport every goal is a good goal right every try is a good try they all we're all worth the same same number of points okay whereas optimizing is where you're you tend to be with promotion focus i want the best and i'm I, i'm willing to explore to find that now when you've got optimizing versus satisficing what you'll find is that satisficers will tend to be more sticky. They will tend to stick with what's known. Again, 
because if we're thinking of prevention focus, we don't want uncertainty, we want certainty. We want, yes, this might not be the best, but it's certainly good enough. And that's plenty for me if I'm in a prevention focus. And whereas if we're looking at promotion focus, we're looking to explore that unknown, to find new experiences. So what recommendations do we have? So coming out of this, we start general. We think, why would someone buy your product? And then we might think a little, we think we want to listen to our consumers, listening for those promotion features and prevention features in, their, in how they speak about your product. Are they, do, are they using your product because it helps them protect their status quo? Or are they using your product because they, it enhances, it enhances what they want, they, they want from life? And you will probably find different answers from different people. So the question then is, who are these people? Where are they? When are they available? How much can they afford? And under what circumstances do people tend to have this promotion or prevention focus? And this, of course, leads to ideas of behavioral segments and personas. So you want to dig into that in more detail. But I think one of the major recommendations that comes out of this is that rather than trying to have one message that speaks to everyone, instead, rather than mixing your message, try to tailor it instead. So when someone's in a promotion focus, you can land a promotion focus message to them and get them to see your product as, it, as, as you would like it to be seen. If they're in a prevention focus, you want them to see it in that way. And so that way, again, it's about being, trying to tailor your message and, and your presentation to the prevention focus that the people are in, in that context. Okay, so I hope that's helpful to you. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Dennis. That was great. Uh, I've learned lots of, about uh, prevention and promotion. Um, it's almost lunchtime here, so I am uh, I'm getting hungry. So that's my why. Uh, my um, I was making notes here. My want is that I'd like some food, and my need is because I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm delighted to welcome Siobhan uh, to the floor and to our panel today. Siobhan Lawless is our final speaker, who is the owner and managing director of the Foods of Athenoy Bakery since its inception in 2004. Behind the Foods of Athenoy is an enthusiastic farm family. And like many farm families, Siobhan began baking deliciously healthy food for their own kitchen table. With 18 years experience running a business in Ireland through good times and bad and now supplying into multiple retail, food service and gifting at home and abroad, the Foods of Athenoy are proud to be recognised as specialists in the development and manufacture of a wide range of gluten-free ambient baked goods, including cereals, crackers, snack bars, cookies and Christmas specialities. And all from their dedicated gluten-free facility on their farm in County Galway with dairy-free and or vegan options also catered for. You can find out more about the company and the products on www.thefoodsofathenry.ie. Thank you so much, Siobhan, for joining us. I'm not sure if it's easier to be the first speaker or the final speaker as you've been waiting patiently to join us. But thank you so much. I'm going to turn off my video and hand over to you right away. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I've enjoyed it. I've been busily learning, so it's neither easy to be first or last. This is not what I do best, so um, everyone is a challenge. So I would like to say a big hello, hola, um, bonjour, to everybody who's listening from all over. Um, as Joanne said, I uh, run a free from bakery business from our farm in East Galway. Um, all details of what we do is on the website, so I won't bore you too much. Basically, uh, in 2004, agriculture. I'm married to a farmer. Um, wasn't doing so good for us, so we decided to try something different. So I started to bake to supplement the farm income, and it went from there. I would class myself as an accidental entrepreneur. Never expected I would be where I am now. I just take it one day at a time, and every day is a good learning day. So we started off in what I would class as um, standard bakery. That's wheaty based products that most of us will be familiar with. And by 2010, I started to look at the free from category 
in terms of what was available and what I could do different and decided that it could be so much better. This is going back a long time now. There's been huge inroads made since lots of great manufacturers around. But back then it was a little bit sad. Um, back then, primarily the purchasers of gluten-free would have been uh, celiacs and somehow or another they were overlooked as a category that deserved some respect in terms of the, you know, the quality of the food they ate. So we started developing um, a gluten-free range back in 2010 to add to the portfolio. And then we had a fire in 11 that burnt the entire place down. That was a bad day. Um, somebody asked me afterwards, why did I stay going? And I said, it's like the, the joke of why did the chicken cross the road? Somehow or another, I felt like we had started to cross the road and we were only halfway across and the journey was equally dangerous, you know, going forward or going back. So I felt we'd never managed to see the other side of the road. So we kept going and we came back, had a few tough years, but here we are now, as Joanne said, manufacturing a, quite a large range of products. You know, I have with bars, cookies, cereals and they cater towards minority diets as I would call it. We operate probably now out of about 20,000 square feet and have 25 people who work with us and just to say in case anyone is checking me out on social media late, later we do not have a full-time resource in-house because we probably just really can't afford it so all the social media we do ourselves so um, while the provenance would be all there because it's very honest and sort of up front, it's not what you'd call super professional. So working in the free from arena is, is very interesting. It's challenging and it can be very rewarding. Like um, Oliver's example of the needs versus the wants, when you provide a product for somebody in that needs category, they really appreciate it and they really respect you and you, you connect with them in a way that you don't with standard consumers, because if somebody is a celiac or has an allergy, to be able to find something that they can trust is actually a huge deal for them. And that's a, a trust and res a mutual respect that we would never take advantage of. Um, but in general, I suppose it's interesting to look at what is healthy eating. And I think it can mean something different for everybody and at different stages of their lives. So. For a long time, people associated healthy eating with maybe calorie counting, reducing sugars or following elimination diets. But however, as time has gone by today, there's a much more nuanced understanding of health, particularly from a nutritional and functional perspective. So I think we're finally beginning to connect the dots that what we put in our bodies has a powerful effect on how we feel both physically and mentally. So the desire for food nourishes the body mind and soul as well as the planet and that idea is gathering pace with consumers so when we lose control slightly of our lives and that was kind of evidenced with covid um amongst other things we know historically we work hard to regain it and at that point as consumers i think we look at what we can control be that you know improving our diets exercise um, and other ways that we feel that we can actually regain control of our lives and lead a better life. Um, Nielsen have called health and wellness the single most powerful consumer force with 48% of global consumers saying they are making proactive health and wellness choices on a regular basis. So within a, a gluten-free slash healthy eating sort of like arena, there's obviously the needs and the wants. So let's not lose sight that celiac disease is a serious autoimmune disorder, whereby the body's immune um, defense system um, attacks the body and you end up with the villi in the um, intestine becoming damaged. And afterwards, in terms of gluten, celiac cannot digest gluten and it invokes an inflammatory response. The symptoms are wide and varied can be really, really severe. And these people really choose to buy on trust. The messaging on packs needs to be really clear because it's, 
it's it's a big it, it's just a, it's a very complicated situation for them to be in so you hear the um the for and against in terms of having all the pot products sitting together on shelf that sort of product integration so gluten-free cream crackers sit beside the standard cream crackers but if you put yourselves in the shoes of somebody who has celiac disease that choice becomes more difficult because they have an awful lot more studying to do on each of those packs to see which ones are suitable and which is not. So for diagnosed celiacs or people with severe dairy allergies or whatever else that we would umbrella under a healthy eating guys, um, they like it to remain in a specialist area because it makes shopping easier and um, faster. But say the people who would choose to eat either gluten-free or other types of eating from a health perspective, they're happy to have it integrated because they browse a completely different parts of the supermarket often. Um, what is gluten? Gluten is a protein that's found in most of your major um, grains like wheat, spelt, uh, barley, rye, etc, etc. Um, there are um, a certain cohort of people, um, probably not widely recognized by the medical community that could suffer from NCGS, which is a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. These uh, people would avoid gluten um, because they feel better if they avoid it. They could have slightly lessened symptoms or they may not. Um, essentially, from a small business point of view, I would say that the marketing persona for these two consumer types is hugely different. And that would be a challenge I would always feel I have because it's like Oliver said, it's um, you're selling them something that they need versus something that they want. And does one type of messaging minimize the, um, the need of the other? So that if you make something sort of, it's all about this will make you feel better is that a negative message to the person who wants it to maybe taste better or improve their lives? Um, at the end of the day, in terms of food manufacturing, taste is king. So once you have the taste, then it's, it's, it's easier to sort of add in the extra sort of like credentials after that. Conscious consumerism is going mainstream and more and more shoppers are scrutinizing the labels on their products. I personally do not suffer from celiac disease, but I would be a, a label reader. I turn each and every product over, and if the back doesn't agree with what I perceive to be a healthy eating, then I just won't buy it. So I would think that at the moment, that self-indulgence is transforming into conscious indulgence. Um, and that leads into also um, the sustainability trend because the health trend is very closely linked to sustainability. And this will become more prevalent as time goes by. We are, I suppose, as a people, becoming more determined to eat cleaner and then to also eat more sustainably. Um, what is sustainability? Obviously, that's probably a whole other webinar topic, but sustainability is also, it's about where the ingredients come from, um, the people who, who make those ingredients, but there's also the whole environmental, social, and economic sustainability issues around sort of the making of food and who makes them and does it contribute, say, to the local economy. Um, moving forward, I think consumers will be seeking out sustainable packaging and climate positive messages, as well as a very clear nutritional um, information. So if you look at, say, potential opportunities in terms of healthy eating, and the perception of healthy eating, one area that's tipped for um, an increase in interest could be those people who are suffering from long COVID. If they've lost taste or um, smell, they're suffering from immune problems and they're looking to boost their immune system. Um, probiotics um, have been shown to be beneficial for post-COVID sufferers. So obviously there are many different areas beyond the perception, our, 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 which could be our own narrow perception of healthy eating that people could look at in terms of food manufacturing. Um, so that's about all I have. I, I mean, I'm happy to take questions. It's just, it's easier sometimes if I understand what people would like to hear about, but um, from a business owner perspective, 
certainly the um, the healthy eating um, category is very wide and varied. Why people choose is also wide and varied. So if you are a, um, a business owner looking to get into it, you need to sort of focus on sort of where you can add value to what's already out there. Thank you, Siobhan. That was great and uh, lovely to hear from you um, about the experiences that you've had. Uh, I have some questions scribbled down here myself uh, to ask you in just a couple of minutes, but we do uh, want our audience to give us some questions as well. And I'd like to invite Elaine and Dennis to come back on camera with us uh, again. Um, hugely insightful across the board uh, from, from everybody. Um, a couple of questions that we have uh, just banding around the place here. Uh, Elaine, have you investigated whether social media has any effect on any other marketing outcomes such as purchasing? Um, yeah, we also have looked at, for instance, people who follow charity brands, just as a for instance, and whether if they follow a charity brand, they're likely to donate. Um, and what you find is, again, if it's kind of promoting the self, they're actually not. Whereas if it has this intrinsic meaning, than they are. And I, I thought what was really interesting um, just now about the presentation was, you know, looking at somebody who identifies, for instance, as celiac, you can see that that brand is then very important to them and their sense of themselves and the identity they have with that. Um, and maybe that links to other types of foods as well, where someone identifies as I'm vegan or I'm, you know, there's something about me, the way I, not, not that I express myself, but that I identify with these types of, of products. Maybe they're necessary for me or they're, they're part of, of my routine. Again, understanding, of course, that um, a celiac, it, it, you know, this is, the, the, necess the medical necessities of using these products, but even broader than that, um, you know, where people, I suppose, see these products as, as related very um, intrinsically to themselves, then yes, you do see the brand outcome. And I think the other thing is that we've looked at trust and, and this came through, I think, just now in, in your presentation, that when people trust the brand and that trust is built maybe through experience of the brand and use of the brand, then you have the more positive brand outcomes as well. Like, for instance, willing to pay more for the brand, willing to purchase the brand, a bit more loyalty. So, yeah, we would see other outcomes that would be um, positive for brands when people have these kind of authentic and trust relationships and also where the brand somehow kind of speaks to the, the person themselves and the inner self for some reason. I think one of the biggest things that has, has come across is a couple of words there that have come across a lot are the authenticity of the brand, yeah. trust in the brand. Um, you know, we, we, you mentioned trends as well, Siobhan. Um, question for you from, I suppose, an industry perspective is, you know, you were originally operating outside of the celiac and the gluten-free area. So how did you build trust with those who would want to purchase your product as the go-to product in the area? for gluten-free. I mean, trust is a huge thing. And we've seen with Dennis as well, um, you know, whether it's a want or a need, but it's trust. So how did you build trust with your consumers? Um, I think, I think I might've said this before, but there are many different types of manufacturers, you know, so there's the from the ground up, you know, day by day with the hard graft, which is an awful lot of Irish small companies. Um, those people, aka also me, start off in a situation where you're maybe doing farmer's markets or you go and you do shows and you meet people and people taste it. So that's one way if you're a small consumer or not small consumer, sorry, a small manufacturer. Equally, then you have the large multinationals. So if I am Mars and I've just launched a vegan Mars bar, obviously I have the money to encourage people to trial and then obviously like. But for us, it would have come from meeting people on the ground. And then after that, I would always say, taste is king. So then if you want to stand up and say, I'm making great tasting gluten-free products, vegan products, or whatever else they are, you just can't throw those words around willy-nilly. You need something to back that up. So if you want to be known for somebody who makes good quality stuff and it's worth tasting, it's because you like it. So 
you then need to reinforce that by entering, say, Taste Awards, uh, Free From Food Awards, Great Taste Awards, Irish Free From Food Awards, Lost in a Heron. All of those awards then add credibility to your claim that it tastes great. So then you put an award like that on the pack, it can uh, make somebody be inclined to pick it up. And then you're hoping that they agree with you that it tastes well enough to justify a second purchase. Okay, Dennis, would you come in there on that as well in terms of uh, building trust and maybe look at the the area that Siobhan mentioned in her presentation as well around trends. Uh, you know, we see that in January last year, there was a big push on Veganuary and vegan products being purchased, whereas this year, actually, there wasn't. The Consumer Index came out last week, I think it was, and uh, they said that there wasn't as big a push on vegan foods and, and vegan um, uptake in, from consumers this year. Is there a thing around trends and people jumping on trends and jumping on the bandwagon to 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 purchase products in a certain um, I suppose a certain silo maybe? Yeah, uh, trends are trends because because people follow them. You know, so yes, certainly that uh, trends are there. I think it's in, one of the things you'll find, and I think what's really interesting about what what Siobhan's talking about in terms of her brand and dealing with say a, a group like and obviously she's got many different segments um but you have some who are going to be a little bit more resistant to change and some who might when you've got a, when you've got a, a market that's dominated let's say by some by by certain products because people are resistant to change that sometimes is an opportunity then for someone to come in with something different and so if if let's say 80% or 70% of, of a market are prevention focused, but there's actually another another segment that are promotion focused, then that promotion focused part of the segment, you can you can provide them something surprising and interesting and use them to generate some momentum that then they become the people the, the the cheerleaders of a trend that then build something that becomes trustworthy trustworthy enough for people for say the more prevention focused individuals to try out and so when we're thinking about um these different motivations i think it's always always worth thinking the, the both motivations are probably out there you're going to be thinking where where are when are they happening where are they happening and then how can you how can you use that how can you exploit that to generate momentum momentum and trends uh, because and because trends generate purchases, but they also generate trust. So uh, it's a really complex complex picture. But um, I think I think there are strategies that can be can be tried there. Okay, uh, Kieran Mannion um, asks, uh, how can companies make their healthy products more appealing in the face of the enormous power of the Oreo type products? Uh, look at Monster and Red Bull actual sales, despite sugar tax legislation, are healthier drinks or the healthier or the healthy message currently just attractive for very niche demographics? So I'm not sure who wants to take that. Elaine, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, sure. And, and I understand that it is a challenge and also probably for many companies, a budgetary challenge as well, because, you know, not every company has the, 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 the financial might of these large brands to be competing either. Um, and it can be very challenging. But I think, you know, it, it comes back to this point about having that brand story and that links to authenticity again. You know, that heritage and the story becomes really important. People connect with that and they like to hear the origin of the brand, the owner, the prominence. You know, they they like that story. And I think, you you know, you might not be mass market, but that might not be what you want to go for anyway it might be a case that you're identifying and i think this comes back to maybe dennis's point around segmenting targeting and positioning as well you can identify key segments that will um connect with that and you know more and more i think people are looking for that so that segment is getting larger where people are concerned about provenance and they're they are concerned um about maybe considering the origin of what they're purchasing as well um, and connecting with the owner, the artisan owner, if you like, of the brand. So even having the owner and the story of that owner and how they develop the brand, even the story of adversity. And we see this where people kind of back brands because they sort of empathize with them. All of that, I think, helps to, to create that connection. 
Um, and, and for maybe what we could call smaller brands, that might be an effective way to go. If I could add in something there, Joanne. Yes, please do. I would just say to that caller to hang tight because we've just come out of two years of COVID mm -hmm. and the big winners in terms of uh, food that we bought during COVID were um, sort of making fakeaways at home, but also unhealthy snacks and treats because somehow or another we were just all, you know, really fed up sitting at home and just munched on chocolates, crisps and sweets. So that's now starting to fade a little bit and we're sort of waking up again, sort of to where we were only a little bit even more invested. So if somebody is out there making drinks that are good for good health or immune boosting, like, you know, kombuchas or that, or mood boosting teas, there's definitely um, a market for it. And I would say, keep your market or keep your branding fresh and your message simple and plain. And then if you're a really small producer, try and find a mix of uh, retailers that will take your product because say for us, we sell equally as well in say um, multiple retailers as we do in speciality retailers. Uh, different type of shopper, but what you find is, is that the products are integrated slightly differently in the stores. You might be in the free from aisle or in a very sort of like set away space in the supermarket, but within um, speciality stores, you are front and center because they don't segregate that type of product. It's kind of, they're in there on the basis of quality and taste. So you find that you'll pick up customers both ways and then you just, you know, take those learnings and grow from them. I am conscious of time. We are just about to go over. Just one final thing. If there was one single piece of advice that each of you would give to our audience today, what would that be? And Dennis, I'm going to come to you first. Ah, uh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so I, I suppose it's listen to consumers and uh, try to figure out what they're trying to do with your product and realize that there are many different, there are many different consumers out there that's that's about it short and simple i love it elaine um i would come back to that storytelling piece the authenticity piece think about what your brand story is what makes you different and part of that is what drove you to create the business and what drove you to build these products and brands and i think that will set you apart brilliant and finally siobhan we give the last word to you Oh, the last word. Okay, so my mantra in life and in business is that there is no such thing as a good day and a bad day. There is a good day and a good learning day. And the good learning days are much more beneficial to you uh, growth as a person and as a business than a bad day ever is. So it's like, it's like turn that frown upside down. So if I'm having a bad day and it's just like, oh, jeepers, you know, I, I just let it go at the end of the evening and I look at it and go, what did I learn from that? And there's always a learning. And then it becomes a good learning day and you just make, turn the negative into a positive. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much to Elaine, Dennis and Siobhan for joining us. Jane, I'm going to give you the final, final word uh, today to say thank you to everybody and some closing remarks. Thank you very much. That's a fabulous positive note to end on, Siobhan. And thank you, Dennis and Elaine, also for your marvellous, insights we had great interaction huge interest and a huge turnout and i think we've all learned a lot here today about healthy eating and what drives us to purchase uh, and so on so i'd like to say a huge thanks and a big thanks to joanne for hosting our webinar today and a big thanks to you the audience delighted to have you here from all over the world and thank you all very much Thank you so much. Hopefully we'll see you soon at our next webinar. So stay tuned for that. But from Galway, thank you very, very much. Have a great day. And remember to turn those uh, days where you might be very happy into very positive days. Slán, Gurmagaf. <laughs>